Good morning. It's Wednesday, August 20th, 2014. This is your morning edition on I-24 News. It is day 44 of Operation Protective Edge, and four and a half hours of quiet ended with the launch of rockets at Israel South this morning. Last night, Hamas breached the extended truce when it fired a salvo of rockets into Beersheba. The fire intensified later into the night. Up to 60 rockets were fired towards Jerusalem and Tel Aviv areas, and Israel South Iron Dome intercepted at least five rockets. Meanwhile, Israeli Air Force uh, planes attacked targets throughout the night in the Gaza Strip in Rafah, Deir al-Barakh and Zaytun. And Hamas is now claiming that Israel struck the home of Hamas military chief Mohammed Def, killing his wife and daughter in the Sheikh Radwan neighborhood. With me this morning is Amir Oren Haard, senior defense correspondent. Good morning, Amir. Good morning, Tal Shalev, I-24 News diplomatic correspondent. Good morning, Good morning. Tal. And Ali Wakid, I-24 News senior Middle East analyst. Ali, I would like to start with you. Good morning. Uh, what do you know uh, from uh, the, the Palestinian side now? D do we know uh, uh, Hamas uh, military chief Mohammed Def's whereabouts right now? Because there are, it is a third person that is mentioned uh, that uh, to have been uh, killed. Hamas is not revealing yet who is this, uh, this uh, third person. But uh, according to my sources in Hamas, Muhammad Def was not in the uh, in the house that was uh, uh, targeted. Uh, we know that uh, most of Hamas uh, military and politically uh, leaders are somewhere. Some would say uh, under uh, Shifa Hospital in the city of uh, of Gaza. But Muhammad Def was not in the apartment that was uh, struck. But uh, there were uh, two phases yesterday of the uh, rockets shooting before the targeting of the house and after the targeting of the house before the targeting, Hamas insisted that its uh, militants did not shoot any of the 12 or 13 uh, rockets that were uh, shot, and uh, Hamas took responsibility for all the rockets that were shot uh, after the uh, house was uh, targeted. Meaning uh, they're blaming Israel for breaching the truce uh, as they see it. They blaming Israel for targeting uh, Muhammad mm -hmm. uh, Dev, and they blame Israel that Israel know that it was not Hamas that shot the mm -hmm. the, the rockets before the uh, airstrike on the apartment in uh, Sheikh Radwan. Uh, what was interesting is that it was not the military wing that uh, revealed that it was a Muhammad Dev family who was targeted, but it was Musa Abu Marzouk, the uh, uh, deputy uh, uh, leader of the Hamas bureau chief, in a post in uh, in his uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, uh, wall. Uh, so there is some mysterious about who is this uh, uh, third person and why Israel who know, that knows that it was not Hamas that shot the rockets decide to uh, uh, target Hamas uh, uh, leader in a, a very critical moment to the uh, negotiations in Cairo. Maybe that's a question that Amir can answer. Why did uh, Israel uh, target Mohammed Def? Was this the next target if or should uh, the fighting continue? Did Israel put it as its next target? Because uh, we um, have no access uh, to uh, all the facts, mm -hmm. we are free to develop a scenario here. This is what we're doing. <laughs> so so um, assuming that um, death is fair game from Israel's perspective, the question operationally is how to surprise death when usually death is the one who initiates an attack against Israel and therefore is in hiding when this attack takes place so that Israel cannot retaliate personally against him. The answer out of this uh, dilemma is that if someone else who uh, did not update Mohammed Def that the ceasefire is going to be broken, if someone else launches the rockets against Israel, then Israel may get a first blow against Def mm -hmm. much the same way as it did against Ahmed Jabri his uh, partner in the military leadership of Hamas uh, in Operation uh, Pillar of Defense. So obviously what happened uh, yesterday afternoon was that an organization other than Hamas launched the rockets uh, against Israel, otherwise Def would have been in hiding mm -hmm. and wouldn't have been targeted. It stands to reason that because the ceasefire was still in place, Def um, believed that he is free to meet with his family that uh, still has a few hours to come out of hiding, to meet with his family, uh, whom he obviously did not see for uh, some time, and then go back into hiding. Israel surprised him by using the uh, launching of rockets by another organization to target him. Now, conspiratorial minds or people with historical uh, memories right. would say that years ago, 30 years ago, 60 years ago, Israel used to provoke 
such a chain of events. Meaning using other groups to uh, change the... Using the or, or abusing or mm -hmm. provoking. provoking. Uh, this does not seem to be in the cards today. It seems that Israel uh, had accurate intelligence and used it uh, to target uh, death. Now, um, on the way over here, there was uh, a car uh, obviously belonging to an animal lover with the uh, bumper sticker, he who saves a cat saves nine lives. Obviously, uh, <laughs> Dev had used seven or eight of his lives, but uh, not the ninth one yet. And, and uh, meaning that we have no confirmation that he is the third person As, and, and so forth. Well, but you know, uh, the uh, uncertainty about it brings to mind the first hours after the uh, Syrian-initiated assassination of Bashir Jamal in September of 1982 in Beirut. Earlier, there were reports that Jamal survived the assassination. Then uh, we found out that he was killed. We have to wait and see uh, where Def is and whether he was wounded in the attack, if he was in the house at all. Because he has all. been wounded in the past. He has been wounded right. time and again. Right. And if he has only been wounded now rather than killed, and if his wife and daughter were killed, obviously it will only strengthen his determination to fight Israel and it will strengthen the uh, extremists within the leadership of Hamas vis-a-vis -vis the moderates. Tal, meaning uh, diplomatically there's not really much uh, left. Uh, the Israeli delegation has left Cairo saying there's no talks now for a long-term truce and the Palestinians are saying they're going to leave today as well. Well, yeah, I think uh, the Israeli Prime Minister, if he could have, uh, maybe uh, there is, he would leave a window open to returning to negotiations, but uh, as uh, time goes by, his security cabinet, which is not really in the loop, but as much as it is on the media, his security cabinet and members of his security cabinet, both from the right and from the left, are very uh, against uh, going back to negotiations. The whole concept of negotiating not only under fire, but negotiating with Hamas is not something very likable inside the Israeli mm -hmm. security cabinet. But then you have to ask, what is the other options? So one of the options which could be uh, um, coming into place, and it's maybe the easiest one from Netanyahu's point of view, is to reach an informal understanding with, uh, with the Hamas of uh, quiet will be answered by quiet and just go back to a, a routine of a very uh, um, tense quiet. Right. But other options that might come up are a UN security. If the Egyptian initiative failed, then there might be well be a UN Security Council resolution in the upcoming days. And this is something that Israel has to be very wary about because th some, this kind of resolution will probably not um, be in favor of Israel regarding uh, the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, and maybe um, if, it would, if there would be a negotiation, there would be an agreement, Israel would have say on how the wording of this would happen in the UN Security Council. Her, the impact is much smaller. There is the U.S., but the U.S. is also quite supportive of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. So if uh, we do get to a point that a U.N. Security Council resolution is, in, is drafted and worded, that the diplomatic arena will be definitely uh, brought to life again. But at the moment, the diplomatic arena is dead, uh, um, and the military and escalation is back to power. And as is uh, the support, perhaps, for Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, uh, with every uh, round of fire, his support, perhaps, within uh, the Palestinian delegation in Cairo, it's also uh, weakened. That's true, and everybody uh, waited uh, to uh, President Abbas to come to uh, um, Cairo Saturday and to declare the new phase right. in the uh, life of the Palestinian Authority uh, con regarding uh, uh, the Gaza Strip. Now we cannot anticipate what would happen uh, Saturday, but uh, unlike the threats of the Palestinian uh, uh, delegation uh, to leave uh, Cairo, uh, President Abbas uh, would like to see his delegation uh, staying there. Uh, Azam al-Ahmad was obliged to say that the uh, uh, delegation is threatening to leave uh, Cairo because of Hamas uh, pressure because of the escalation that Hamas uh, uh, say it was not the reason Hamas did not launch this uh, this round of uh, uh, of escalation uh, the uh, Palestinian Authority via Mahmoud Abbas and uh, President Sisi and the presence of uh, 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 King Abdullah in uh, uh, in Cairo are doing every effort in order uh, to maintain the talks between uh, Israel and between the uh, and between the uh, uh, Palestinians but if the this Palestinians, reported uh, assassination of uh, or attempted assassination of Mohammed Def, is this not a game changer in, term, in terms of Hamas? I don't know because of the fact that we don't know whether uh, uh, Muhammad Def mm -hmm. was was hurt. In my opinion, if he was hurt, 
the uh, answer of Hamas, the retaliation of Hamas would be much uh, more uh, uh, difficult than we saw uh, uh, last uh, last night. It is true that we Hamas shot uh, between 40 to 50 uh, rockets, but we do remember that when Jabari uh, was killed, the number of rockets was much more uh, uh, important. Uh, um, Hamas and the both Hamas part of the Palestinian delegation and the Israeli delegation, according to Egyptian uh, sources and to the sources of the Palestinian Authority, did not meet the minimum of the uh, demands of the Egyptian uh, of the Egyptian uh, draft. The Egyptian believed that since the day before yesterday, that the Israelis, both Israel and Hamas, wanted some kind of exit from the right. uh, from the uh, from the draft. Israel was worried that this paper would create a political commitment that will create a crisis into the Israeli uh, uh, inside the Israeli uh, government and the, the Egyptian draft did not give the immediate uh, victory, photo victory uh, that Hamas Poor so Hamas. much uh, uh, so much uh, needed. But that could be a game changer from, for Netanyahu inside the Israeli public, right. at least, because uh, Netanyahu he's has been looking for yeah. a victory sign. And this can definitely give him something. You know, he's very limited in what he can do in a operation from now on because of international legitimacy. And there have been calls to uh, target the Hamas leadership all along the way. If, uh, if again, we'll wait and see what happened. But if, again, Def was uh, killed, not hurt, and he is the third person that this for Netanyahu inside the, the public and the cabinet, this is definitely would be an achievement and could save uh, an expansion of the operation uh, after in the upcoming days. Well, the question is whether Hamas would stop here because Israel has its uh, own uh, victory sign. We're just going to say there's a code red uh, siren in the south now of Israel. Uh, Amir. Um, Tal is correct uh, regarding uh, Netanyahu's uh, possible motive. But the result uh, may not necessarily be like that. Um, each time Israel uh, has managed to assassinate uh, a Hezbollah or Hamas or Fatah leader, the results were not uh, in favor of the government in power. Um, Hussein Musawi of Hezbollah in 92, Shamir lost uh, to Rabin. Um, Yahya Ayash, Paris, lost to uh, Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. so, so the urge... Politically, you mean. Politically. So the urge to do it uh, is very uh, short-lived because uh, the people in the South will say, hurrah, uh, good for you, Bibi, for uh, having uh, assassinated death, our arch enemy. But still, we have to live here. And the rockets and the mortar shells uh, keep falling on us. So what are you really doing? Now, it's interesting to see the announcement that the IDF spokesman uh, has put out uh, yesterday at uh, 4.27 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. and uh, Before uh, the salvo of rockets. No, no, right after right, the right salvo after the first of one. Of, right. after the first salvo and uh, announcing the retaliation. Of course, it didn't mention death, but it also did not mention Hamas. Usually, the announcements say the uh, terror organization Hamas is the address for whatever is happening uh, in Gaza. Now, whether it was done because Hamas was not the originator, or whether in order to keep some operational surprise uh, is yet uh, to be seen. But the uh, political or diplomatic uh, fact, which is interesting, is that for the last week or so, with several uh, breaks, Israel has been conducting negotiations with the national unity government of Hamas. The delegation in Cairo is in microcosmos. Uh, just um, a Palestinian uh, society, really. The, it's the Palestinian <laughs> unity government right. uh, negotiating with Israel, with coalition politics within the parties which constitute the government and therefore the delegation. So this is uh, probably the shape of things to come when Israel is going to find itself uh, confronting a national unity government from now on. But Tal, just yesterday we were speaking about Netanyahu's uh, options, and we, we were saying how he doesn't really have that many options, and he's going down to the southern residents and doesn't really have much to say to calm them. Now is the situation different for him? You said you said uh, death may be a game changer, but also rockets back in Israel, perhaps another IDF uh, expansion of an operation. Now it's a new game for Netanyahu, perhaps. Well, I think Netanyahu uh, is very wary about the residents of the South and uh, the fact that maybe a, an interesting thing, one of the PR uh, strategic uh, consultants of them is the PR strategic consultant of the head of the opposition, Itzhak Bougie mm. Herzog. And just um, if we go back to uh, the second Lebanon war and Ehud Olmert that eventually lost, uh, lost his reign because of the war and because of the protest of the uh, reserve uh, 
the reserve uh, uh, soldiers. Right. Um, there is this uh, war, uh, this Gaza war is uh, dra is going on and on. And Netanyahu, each day that goes by, he's losing his support and losing his standing in many ways because people understand that Netanyahu is not in. At least it's perceived that Netanyahu is not in any control of the situation, and he's been the whole situation is being dictated by, by Hamas or either other Palestinian factions. But Netanyahu didn't have a say all along the way, and I think he is very aware and. Since Netanyahu himself uh, was one of the forces behind the reserve, uh, the reserve uh, uh, soldiers' mm -hmm. protest after the Second Lebanon War, he is definitely aware of the fact he knows that, the game. <laughs> that this could be motivated for a political uh, for political reasons, and I think this is something he is very aware of. Uh, even assuming that Death was killed in this attempt, he might have left a will, uh, which is going to be a hallowed document for the Palestinians, also a contingency. Uh, plan. Perhaps he was killed, and then there was this salvo because he left orders that should I be killed in an Israeli operation, you, my successors, should go on with the struggle. It may turn out to be uh, worse for Israel without death right now than with him. Do you agree, uh, Ali? Will it be uh, worse for Israel without death? Has death uh, been able to maintain control throughout the operation and maintain support? Yeah, I think, but we should not exaggerate in the weight of uh, of Muhammad. If we are talking about a paralyzed uh, person, about a person who is physically uh, very uh, limited. Muhammad Def is more than uh, than a symbol. Is more a symbol mm -hmm. than uh, the real uh, leader, effective figure, leader right. of the uh, Hamas uh, military wing. We know that Marwan Isa is the one who is on the daily base uh, leading the uh, military uh, activity of uh, of Hamas, and we know that the uh, officers of each and every uh, zone in the uh, Gaza Strip are the one who are forming the headquarter of uh, uh, of Hamas, but no doubt that this was supposed to be a very tough moral uh, um, uh, hit to Hamas mm -hmm. if Muhammad Def was uh, uh, was targeted. The way the reactions uh, in Hamas uh, started, we didn't see any press conference of Abu Ubaidah. It was via a post in the uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook right. of uh, uh, Musa uh, um, Abu Marzouk, show that, in my opinion, Muhammad Def was not was not uh, hurt or at least was not uh, uh, was not uh, killed. But uh, Hamas is is we saw yesterday from the reaction that Hamas was looking for its direction, whether to retaliate hard and, and firm or uh, to keep some uh, 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 channels open with the Egyptians. And the day yesterday was a very tough day for Hamas. Uh, uh, I, I heard that uh, Tohami was General Tohami from the Egyptian intelligence was shouting over Hamas uh, representatives uh, in uh, in Cairo. It was not an easy day for uh, Hamas. The Egyptians were putting all the pressure in the world. And the day before yesterday. Even Hamas was uh, uh, almost gave an, an, a commitment to the Egyptians that even without extending officially uh, the, the ceasefire, there won't be uh, uh, rockets against uh, uh, Israel uh, uh, zones. And we saw what happened. Uh, right. uh, we saw what happened yesterday. Hamas is leading a very serious investigation to know what was the motivation for the faction uh, that shot uh, yesterday afternoon the rockets. We're going to get a quick now update from I24 news correspondent Shachel Pellet. Shachel, you're in Ashkelon this morning, a city that had seen uh, some quiet in the past few days, but woke up today to sirens. Yes, uh, good morning, Yael. Uh, actually, a few minutes ago, we've heard uh, yet another siren and uh, probably an interception over the skies of the southern city of Ashkelon, uh, marking officially uh, the end of the ceasefire to anyone who wasn't certain after a barrage of over 50 rockets that was fired uh, to um, various parts of uh, the country uh, last night. Uh, according to the Palestinian sources, this is uh, a retaliation in response to the uh, uh, Israeli Defense Forces' attempt to kill uh, Muhammad Def the uh, head of the uh, Hamas military wing, uh, eventually killing uh, his wife and daughter, according to these uh, sources. We haven't heard uh, an official response from Israel, uh, but the uh, Israeli ministers, uh, some of the Israeli ministers saying that uh, a harsh and fierce uh, retaliation of Israel should be uh, now uh, um, against Hamas. And here in the villages and towns uh, bordering uh, uh, the Gaza Strip and uh, the city of Ashkelon, residents are very much uh, confused. Most 
most of the uh, residents uh, who have fled uh, their homes in the past six, seven weeks have returned uh, to uh, the villages bordering Gaza, uh, and now they are not certain what to do. They, uh, under the instructions of the Home Front Command, they, they spend the night in the shelters and in uh, secure structures, um, and the, there has been an order for any village and town and city in the uh, proximity of 80 kilometers from the Strip to remain uh, near shelters and to open uh, public uh, structures uh, that can uh, secure uh, uh, the residents. Uh, and so it seems that uh, Israel is back to uh, a, a war atmosphere. Shahar, yeah, you do uh, say the new uh, regulations by the Home Front Command, which did change uh, now overnight, uh, up to 80 kilometers uh, from the Gaza Strip, but need to have uh, bomb shelters open. What about the day of life, uh, the, the, the surrounding uh, uh, day, of, day and routine in Ashkelon? Is it back to normal uh, this morning, or do you see maybe a, s a slowing in pace? It is August still. Well, uh, it, it's difficult to say. We haven't been in the city itself, but uh, from what I've heard uh, from residents, they've been trying to uh, continue with their, their lives as normal as possible. Uh, they continue to live in, in fear and concern. Uh, many in the past week, even though uh, there was a continuous ceasefire, uh, kept uh, uh, nearby uh, shelters and some even didn't leave their homes. Although uh, we have seen uh, the uh, shopping malls and, uh, uh, and shopping centers uh, uh, fairly packed with people but uh, we're talking about a, a week and a half before returning to schools and uh, most of the uh, uh, regional councils here and the cities aren't certain that most of the schools will be open and that the uh, uh, routine and, and da daily life here will in fact be uh, possible uh, uh, to return to normal. Many of the uh, uh, facilities aren't uh, well prepared for uh, an escalation or for rocket fire. Um, there are many schools without proper shelters. Uh, this has been an ongoing call for from the uh, heads of the regional councils here to the government to secure uh, most of the uh, areas here without shelters. And uh, so there's much uh, uncertainty and, and much confusion uh, as regards to the future. Shahal Pellet, uh, thank you for joining us, our I-24 news correspondent there in Ashkelon. Amir, uh, we're hearing, of course, that the Israeli Air Force has struck uh, almost uh, 30 targets in the Gaza Strip overnight, meaning the ground offensive would be the next step, uh, logically? Well, it um, is not inevitable, and even those 30 targets, uh, one uh, should wonder uh, where did they uh, come from? Right. Israel has supposedly uh, gotten rid of whatever it could. Uh, perhaps during the uh, ceasefire period, some new uh, targets uh, popped up. Um, a ground operation uh, would only uh, be launched if Israel decided to go all the way. There is no midway point. Um, All the way, meaning reoccupying the Gaza Strip. Or reoccupying parts of Gaza City mm -hmm. where the leadership of Hamas supposedly is. Um, going from uh, the Israeli uh, Palestinian border, the Israeli Gaza border, all the way to the sea, to the Mediterranean. Um, it's difficult to see any energy left in the Israeli public for that, as we are. Uh, 10 days before the start of the school year, mm -hmm. as uh, we are entering the 45th day or so of the operation, if Hamas keeps launching 50 rockets a day and they still have more than 2,000, it means that we are in for 40 more days of this war of attrition. This is not something the Israeli public uh, would uh, take uh, lightly, but it would also not like the idea of taking uh, a ground action which would cause many Israeli mm -hmm. casualties. But there are cabinet members that maybe may disagree with Amir. I'm not sure it's only the ca cabinet ministers. When There was a poll yesterday published by the Israeli Demo uh, Institute for Democracy which uh, checked the approval ratings of uh, the conduct of the operation. And uh, most of the Israeli public, a majority of the Israeli public, was is supportive and very satisfied with the whole operation Protective Edge. And only 6% thought there was excessive use of force just to show the uh, gap between the Israel public opinion and the international public mm. opinion, which is quite uh, amazing or astounding, I think, in my point of view. But uh, um, yes, inside the, the Israeli security cabinet, there are a lot of people who think and who have been calling from the beginning. And we might hear the foreign minister of Igdor Lieberman said, I said from day one, we need to go for, to, for a full takeover. But the fact is that Netanyahu and the defense minister have been reluctant to do so up until now. And I find it hard to believe that at this point now, when there's almost zero international legitimacy, uh, given the 
already very high death toll and devastation in Gaza Strip, I've doubted that now Netanyahu will believe that this is the time to launch. And th the fact is, uh, the Israeli Security Cabinet mm. is not really making the decisions. The decisions are made only by Netanyahu and Yalon. So if we are counting on how we've seen them behave up until now, I don't think there's a high chance of him launching a ground offensive. But of course, Everything depends on what happens on the ground. If, again, there would be a tunnel attack, then the Netanyahu would, uh, another tunnel attack, Netanyahu will probably have to make up another to decide what is the next modus right. operandi, and uh, he, he isn't because definitely going to be in a trap. Because what is uh, the alternative as, uh, for the Israeli public? You, you mentioned the overwhelming support for this operation. There, if, if 50 rockets continue coming into Israel per day, the diplomacy in Cairo is... Uh, dead, quote-unquote, what is the next step uh, that Netanyahu can go to? International uh, support? Well, I think Netanyahu is trapped. He's in a mm -hmm. situation where he doesn't... Uh, this whole military operation has been has not been accompanied by a long-term strategy. Right. And I, that I do think that the Israeli public is starting to understand. I'm not sure the Israeli public understands that how much that Netanyahu will have to make a compromise with the Palestinian Authority and boost, and that he's been reluctant to do so. That may be one of the reasons that the Cairo negotiations have not... One of the reasons that the Cairo neg uh, negotiations did not produce any breakthrough, but there is, I hope, I, I don't know, I hope, but there could be a growing demand for Netanyahu, and you hear it at least inside the uh, cabinet from the left-wing ministers, to create a much more bigger strategy, something wider that will give an answer to the problem and not just to the Gaza Strip. The public support, uh, which Tal mentioned, has to do with the uh, restraint character of the operation mm -hmm. from an Israeli perspective. The excessive use of force, artillery or air attacks, this is uh, something which does not interest the Israeli public. Right. Palestinian casualties are um, the Israeli public couldn't care less about unless they bring about international pressure. But from a humanitarian point of view, they couldn't care less. However... Because uh, of the fear they had on their own side. Beca on the own because front. they are bitter, because the Israelis believe that they were attacked and that they have the right to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. But they also don't want to be uh, sucked into Gaza for a year or more. Uh, taking care of 1.8 million Palestinians with all the economic and other costs uh, involved uh, and the impact on the Israeli economy. So if Israelis uh, are still in support of Netanyahu and the Alon and their strategy, it is because, in their view, they were uh, moderate, not because they were uh, militant, and therefore they will not support another ground action which may be even costlier than the 64 uh, combat casualties we had up to now. And this is not theory. Right now there are bereaved families which Netanyahu and Yalon and others have to visit. They have to hear criticism and they understand what is in store for them if they go in even deeper. All right, Amir Oren, uh, thank you for joining us. Tal Shalev, thank you. Ali Waka, thank you. We're going to go quickly to the I-24 News Desk for more headlines from this morning, and we'll be back with more of this morning edition, day 44 of Operation Protective Edge. We'll be right back. Welcome back to I-24 News Morning Edition. It is day 44 of Operation Protective Edge. And the four and a half hours of quiet ended uh, this morning uh, with the launch of rockets at Israel South. Just a few minutes ago, we had uh, code red sirens in Ashkelon and interceptions. Last night, Hamas breached the extended truce when it fired a salvo of rockets into Beersheba. The fire intensified later into the night. Almost up to 60 rockets were fired towards Jerusalem and Tel Aviv areas in Israel south. An Iron Dome intercepted at least five rockets. Meanwhile, Israel Air Force attacked targets throughout the night in the Gaza Strip. And Hamas is now claiming that Israel struck the home of Hamas military chief Mohammed Def, killing his wife and daughter in the Sheikh Radwan neighborhood. With me now is Dr. Eli Kalmon, Senior Research Scholar, Institute for Counterterrorism at the IDC Herzliya. Good morning, Dr. Kalmon. Thank you for joining us. Anthony Grant, you will be here with some headlines. And Amir Oren, you're still here from Haaretz, Senior Defense Correspondent. I do want to start with you. Uh, Mohammed Def, we've been talking about it. If, if it is a game changer, yes or no. But right now, the political tools at Israel's uh, uh, feet are, are very slim. Uh, still, maybe even slimmer than it was yesterday. 
Yes, and therefore um, the indirect effect of uh, this operation, of this uh, targeted killing, uh, whether it succeeds or not is yet to be seen, uh, is even more important than the actual uh, result, because um, obviously this is the proactive edge of protective edge. If Israel has undertaken this assassination attempt, it was probably meant uh, above all else to change the game not between itself and Hamas, but within the leadership of Hamas in the tug of war between Khaled Marshall and Musa Abu Marzouk and perhaps uh, Ismail Meaning Amiya, it, thought it, would, it would be the closing gong, if you will, of this uh, operation? It didn't really think it would start a whole new uh, phase of the operation. Well, Israel probably um, concluded that the operation is not going to end uh, and uh, it is being dragged into a war of attrition. Attrition could be uh, diplomatic, not only militarily, mm -hmm. but obviously if uh, every other day a mortar shell or a rocket would to have landed, would uh, have landed uh, in uh, an open field even in the south of Israel, but the residents wouldn't have uh, felt secure enough to uh, send their children uh, to school or to kindergarten uh, a few days from now, then there would be uh, a lot of political pressure on the Israeli government. It wants to bring this operation to a conclusion one way or the other. And this uh, could uh, have been meant to put pressure on the moderates within uh, Hamas to reach a decision and get some sort of understanding with Israel. And a quick clarification, uh, we're getting reports of uh, 2,000 reservist soldiers are being uh, called back up to their units. This is mainly Home Front Command because now the Home Front is uh, being attacked again. Uh, it must be uh, mostly uh, home front uh, uh, command soldiers, but also it could be people who are needed to replace regular units mm -hmm. who were taken out of uh, the Gaza border and perhaps are going to be sent just as a cautionary move. So no uh, extension or expansion of the operation uh, well, for now? Two, 2,000 um, reservists uh, do not make uh, a major right. uh, campaign. Not, not yet. Uh, Amir, thank you. Uh, Anthony, you're here with some headlines. Let's start, of course, uh, with the right. newspaper uh, of we have, uh, the most circulated. Right, Yadiot right. Aranot, which uh, a little bit higher there. This is actually um, basically saying IDF attacked in Gaza, unusual target, referring, of course, to Mohammed mm -hmm. uh, Adif. And uh, there with the picture there, too. Well, there you go. So, yeah, that's what uh, Israelis have woken up to in the press this morning. And that's, of course, we've been talking about that um, extensively. Also wanted to um, to show uh, an article from The Guardian, which actually backtracking just a little bit, this mm -hmm. article uh, was uh, basically saying here, Israel uh, launches fresh airstrikes in Gaza in response to rocket fire. Now, this actually was published after uh, yesterday's uh, rockets towards Beersheba and before uh, there were more in the evening. And what I find interesting is that you see kind of, um, in a lot of the British press, we've talked about this, there's kind of this reflexively putting um, Israel first before Gaza in the headline mm -hmm. and it's kind of an attempt some could say to put Israel in the position of the aggressor when in fact it's quite the contrary. Yeah. Well but if we you read the sub headline from, it says ceasefire uh, negotiation. Uh, you know there is this uh, old uh, uh, story about two children fighting and when the father of one of them uh, tries to stop them and asks his son what is it all about he says it all started when he hit me back. <laughs> yeah well touche. But again, that's something that uh, is uh, we're going to be seeing more of, I think, and this sort of um, the uh, the way the British, a right. lot of the press handle the situation in, in Israel. Right. You need to uh, read in a little bit more to really understand uh, what exactly. happened Exactly. Uh, and going over to a major American newspaper now, uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, reports that this, uh, this is their headline, Secretive Army of Hamas Emerges from Shadows in Gaza. And they're referring to the Qassam Brigade and saying that the conflict has brought this guerrilla army of Hamas into battle against Israel, talking about um, the commando units that Israel believes took shape really in the past uh, year, the ones that are doing these uh, uh, hit-and-run ambushes along the border. And again, this might be kind of obvious stuff for people in Israel, but for right. people in the United States who are trying to make heads uh, sense of what's going on, this an article like this is, uh, is quite um, helpful 
if, if in terms of nothing else, educating about some of the, uh, the situation within Hamas um, on the ground, so to speak. But this doesn't, uh, of course, surprise anyone here in Israel. It's well, not a secretive army. No, it's not right. a secret. This is the, um, uh, as Adina Kassam, who was the, one of uh, the uh, originators of uh, the Palestinian uh, movement back in the 1930s and was killed by the British, uh, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Palestine. This is uh, old stuff for Israel. But in the West, there is some uh, effort to understand, if you would take the Iranian example, what is the Revolutionary Guard, what is the Quds force within the Revolutionary Guard, and here too, what is the difference between Hamas as a movement with political and welfare wings, right. and what is as Adina Kassam brigades, uh, this is all one and the same. Right. Mm. And uh, speaking of, of Hamas yet again, Jerusalem Post, a headline here which was kind of um, Again, maybe not a big surprise for those in Israel, but internationally. A Palestinian authority says Hamas shot Fatah men in the legs during Gaza fighting. Now, basically, uh, you have General Adnan Damiri, spokesman for the Fatah-dominated Palestinian Authority security forces in the West Bank, who's confirming that some of these Fatah activists within Gaza, who were basically forbidden from leaving Gaza during recent hostilities, were actually shot in the legs by, they're saying, people from Hamas. Hamas is saying that it, it wasn't from any big official order, but it was individuals acting alone, that murky water. But again, but this, this too goes back to 2007, when the um, uh, fighting between Hamas and Fatah in Gaza started, exactly. and before Fatah people were pushed out of windows in uh, skyscrapers, yes. before that they were shot in the knees or in the legs. This is uh, a very usual method of hitting people that Hamas So it shows used. you the kind of people that, uh, you know, the world is dealing with. And on, on a similar, um, uh, very tragic note, we have mm. this story from the Daily Beast in the United States, of course, widely reported all over the world now. Mm. Um, ISIS thugs behead American journalist. And of course, referring to uh, photojournalist James Foley, who had been missing in Syria for two years. And uh, the group known as ISIS has, uh, has uh, murdered him in cold blood, and they've posted a, a video about yeah. it. So this is a, a horrible news. It recalls, of course, uh, Daniel Pearl, who in 2002, Wall Street Journal reporter, was uh, beheaded. It was filmed. Um, I, I think also it, it bears mentioning that um, the social media, which are YouTube in this case, of American companies, are they helping to give a platform to this kind of thing? I would say it's problematic, to say the least. And of right. course, they're threatening another journalist, and, and it's basically uh, throwing down the gauntlet to Obama, saying it's up to you to uh, intercede here right. as a response uh, to the taking of the, the dam in, in Mosul, the retaking of it. So intertwined world in a very uh, dark way. Well, the sort story of story like which uh, sends chills up the spine of every journalist it's and no, whose, head, yes. whose head is dear to him. No journalist wants to ever become the story. And of course, this is uh, like the worst example of that. And right. uh, someone who was just drawn into this and dealing with, again, as the headline says, thugs. I mean, these people think that they're sort of the only interpreters of uh, whatever, this caliphate craziness. And to the rest of the world, uh, it is, uh, it's shocking, it's, it's alarming. And, uh, and again, they, and, they and the word, business. And the word headline carries a special meaning in this case. And, and it does bring the story uh, back home to the Americans, which maybe and up until now were quite uh, maybe uh, detached, detached uh, from yes. the situation. Dr. Cremona, it's yes. interesting to, uh, to look at our region, uh, also in the micro, uh, look at the Gaza-Israeli conflict, but also there's a bigger threat looming. And, and this is something that other regional uh, leaders, Turkey, Egypt, and so forth, are going to look at as well. What's more important to them right now? Is it going to be to solve and be a mediator between Israel and Gaza, or they have, you know, the Islamic State on the heels of their uh, borders? It depends to, to whom you uh, refer, because the Egyptians clearly, the main threat is from Gaza, from the Muslim Brotherhood, because the Hamas is the only uh, armed Muslim Brotherhood movement. They influence not only the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, but also the jihadists in uh, Sinai, which mm -hmm. are a direct threat to the regime and to the uh, stability of Egypt. Uh, and then they also look to uh, uh, Iraq, but because of the Saudi interest, especially Jordanian interest, Turkey has a very complicated uh, 
by the way, policy. On the one hand, they are fighting against the, uh, if you want, against the Assad regime. At the same time, they are supporting the uh, ISIS. Probably they tried to support them, or they uh, gave them some kind of facilities to penetrate the territory of Syria, and then lo lost control because now the ISIS, for instance, they took uh, 49 diplomats of Turkey mm -hmm. as uh, prisoners right. in uh, Mosul. And they're also trying to be mediators here uh, okay. throughout, within uh, Hamas and Israel. Erdogan sees uh, Hamas and his support of the Hamas, not of the Palestinians, of the Hamas, as part of his neo-Ottoman uh, agenda. Uh, he spoke uh, uh, when he received the pres presidency that, uh, you know, the Palestinians will see my successes. Uh, your success, also he spoke about Bosnia, he spoke about uh, Syria, because he sees himself as a kind of sultan. I have a movie that was filmed in 2009, uh, mm -hmm. before the Ma Mavi Marmara, and uh, uh, organized by the famous IHHH uh, organization movement, which supported the Hamas at the time. And you see thousands and thousands of Hamas supporters with uh, uh, photos of uh, Erdogan and cheering the next sultan of the Muslim world. So uh, Erdogan sees in this uh, support of the Palestinian Islamists a uh, way in order to enhance his own image in the Muslim world. But also when you look at uh, Israel's uh, list of security threats, yes. uh, ISIS is not the first one. We do have uh, Hamas first and so forth. What is so, uh, I would say, uh, characteristic now of uh, many Israeli political leaders, mostly on the right, is to compare, to, to tell the world Hamas is exactly like ISIS, it's exactly like Boko Haram and so forth. Is that, uh, is, is that actually correct? Can yeah. we make these comparisons? First of all, I'd like to speak about what many uh, Israeli politicians, including the government, says that uh, we don't want to destroy Hamas because we are afraid of the chaos that the, uh, the Salafist and right. uh, Jihadists will take control. This is not true because all these groups began to be active only in 2007 when the Hamas took control. If you look to the West Bank, there are no such groups. And Hamas uh, was a kind of a strategic umbrella, uh, a bit like the Taliban for the Al Qaeda. Because, and by the way, the Egyptians see this. They are quite aware that Hamas permits the jihadists to enter Sinai and fight the Egyptian government. That's why they were so serious in trying to uh, control the, the Hamas or to weaken Hamas. So uh, you cannot uh, say that they are not uh, jihadists. Mm -hmm. The Hamas itself has a jihadist agenda, but it's on the long term. In the sense that they, first of all, would like to Islamize Palestine liberate by all of Palestine, they Islamized, political and, first, then, right. and then they, according to the program, they continue also to the caliphate, okay? They must be much more, if you want, uh, 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 constrained because they have a huge constituency to defend, at least at, at this moment. If they indeed would uh, uh, take control of Palestine, of Israel, I'm sure that they will uh, behave to us, to the Jews, and the Christians, by the way, exactly like uh, the, the Daesh, because they see in them the enemies of the faith and the enemies of their, of their values. And in your opinion, when we see, uh, unfortunately, such gory pictures of uh, beheading of American yes. journalists and so forth, this comes uh, just a week after we saw the Yazidis on the mountain, which yes. some will say prompted the U.S. administration to interse intercept. Do you believe that the Americans or a Western coalition of any sort will now be taking a more active stance in the region? Uh, I hope so, at least uh, by using air power, not mm -hmm. uh, uh, boots on the ground. I think it's not only the Yazidis. What uh, worried Americans is the crumbling of the Kurdish state, which is actually the best uh, ally in the region there, in uh, uh, Western Asia, if you want. So it's more interest-based yes. and it's not clearly, uh, in humanitarian. Be because the Kurds, since 1991, uh, since the first Gulf War, were supporting uh, the West and especially the American troops. They permitted the troops to fight mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein in 2003. So it was very important, although the Americans do not want the independence of Kurdistan, but uh, uh, paradoxically, the support they give now to the uh, Kurds could uh, bring the uh, quicker independence. Yeah. And we see, by the way, the Shia government and some Arab tribes were opposing the support of the Kurds. Amir? Uh, Muslims have no uh, monopoly over these atrocities, over these horrors. And if you um, go back to the Inquisition, or if you visit Stockholm and go to a military museum and see how uh, present day Scandinavians fought each other with ferocity and cruelty, you know that this is not 
uh, only a Muslim trademark. However, there is now a fight in the world between the forces of progress, between the forces uh, of the future, and those who want to take us back to medieval and even pre-medieval time, mm -hmm. like those ISIS and Hamas and jihadists, and uh, in this case, the forces of progress must prevail. By the way, Mexico, there are hundreds of beheadings. Nobody sh uh, showed them. No, but no. I saw pictures. Other interests, of it's course. Uh, really, yes, Dr. it's criminal. Cohen. It's criminal, but it's uh, like a terror. It's a terror, uh, crimi a criminality, if you want. Dr. Kamon, thank you for joining us. Thank Anthony, you. you'll be back. Amir, thank you. We're getting our reports now. I'm quoting an Israeli media report saying that an Israeli, quoting an Israeli official, saying that Israel did uh, try to uh, uh, assassinate the Mohammed Def, and also other ministers are now speaking out about it. We will be updating you as it comes in. First, the headlines, and we'll be back with more. Welcome back. It's still Wednesday, August 20th, 2014. This is your morning edition on I-24 News. It is day 44 of Operation Protective Edge. And a few hours of quiet during the night ended with the launch of rockets at Israel south this morning. Last night, Hamas breached the extended truce when it fired a salvo of rockets into Beersheba. The fire intensified later into the night. Up to 60 rockets were fired towards the Jerusalem and Tel Aviv areas in Israel's south, Iron Dome intercepting just some of them. Meanwhile, Israeli Air Force attacked targets throughout the night in the Gaza Strip, and Hamas had claimed that Israel struck the home of Hamas military chief Mohammed Def. We are now receiving reports that Israeli sources are confirming uh, that uh, Israel did try to assassinate Mohammed Def without confirming, of course, the whereabouts of Def right now. With me in studio is Boaz Bismat, foreign affairs editor for Israel Ayom. Good morning, Boaz. Good Thank morning. you for joining us. And Ali Wakid, I-24 News senior Middle East analyst. Thank you for staying with us. We're going to take a quick uh, look at a report that was first aired on I-24 News Defense magazine talking about Israel's policy of targeted assassinations. Let's take a look. The second Palestinian intifada that struck Israel with an unprecedented terror wave in late 2000 forced Israel's security establishment to come up with fast and decisive solutions. One of those, which became the main tool in fighting the different terror factions, was the targeted killing of senior operatives and commanders. Most of them were carried out from the air. The first targeted killing took place on November 2000. Hussein Abayat, a top Fatah military wing commander, was hit by an Israeli Air Force Apache missile while in his car in Bethlehem. I believe that this retaliation can intensify the level of activity by Fatah militants in the region for the short term. But in the long term, everyone who attempts to hurt Israeli soldiers and civilians needs to know that he will not be immune. Over the years, Israel took out numerous terror operatives in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. Some of them needed a second attempt after the first one failed. This was the case of Abdelaziz Rantisi, once the notorious spokesman for Hamas, and afterwards one of its military commanders. In June 2003, Rantisi survived an airstrike on his car in Gaza. The resistance shall continue until the occupation is defeated. Jewish will have no personal security in Palestine. They have to leave our land. In April 2004, the result was different. Just a month after Hamas's spiritual leader, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, was assassinated, an IAF missile hit Rantisi in the streets of Gaza. One of the main problems of targeted killings is the collateral damage, a laundered phrase for the deaths of innocents during these strikes. That was the case on the night of July 22, 2003. An Israeli F-16 dropped a bomb on a house in a Gaza neighborhood. The target, Saleh Shkade, the head of the Hamas military wing, the Qassam Brigades, was killed. But so were 15 innocent residents of his building, 11 of them children. Israeli leaders and IDF commanders found themselves under huge criticism and tried to justify the assassination. Salah Shkadek orchestrated terror attacks until his last moment, until last night. One of them was planned to be executed from the Gaza Strip in the coming days. After the Intifada ended, the Israeli targeted killing machine continued its operations. One of the most well-known took place in November 2012. The IAF launched a missile on a moving car in Gaza. The target, Ahmed Jabari, the Hamas military leader, was killed on the spot. During Operation Protective Edge, Israel carried out several targeted killings. Just a few hours after Hamas naval commando militants failed to infiltrate southern Israel, the IAF hit Mohammed Shaban, the unit's commander. Hamas sustained a serious blow to all of its systems 
its commanders, who are sitting in bunkers underneath sensitive sites they use as cover, will come out, see the extent of the damage that occurred to their fighters, and see the extent of damage in the Gaza Strip, unfortunately because of Hamas. We're not done. The military is prepared for anything. Should future events arise, we will know how to respond. Ali, of course, we did show this report. Uh, because it is an Israeli, uh, maybe not a direct policy, but it, it ha we have a, a history of uh, targeted assassinations. Uh, now that we are hearing uh, confirmed reports that Israel is behind a, a, a targeted attempted assassination of Mohammed Def, we haven't heard anything really from Hamas basically saying that, he, that his daughter and wife were killed, but Mohammed Def uh, has not been confirmed dead, and there is a third body. There is a third body, and of course, uh, nobody revealed wh who is this uh, uh, third body. In the history, you know, in the period of truce, it was the moment where uh, the big uh, fugitive guys uh, get out from their uh, hitting uh, places and were uh, targeted by the uh, by the Israelis. We don't know whether this was uh, the case uh, this time, but if Muhammad Def is alive, if Muhammad Def was not heard, I believe that Hamas will try to expose him uh, in a speech uh, this evening or, or later on uh, today or uh, tomorrow. And it's important to note that he's been uh, targeted in the past. He has serious at least, injuries. At least uh, five times mm -hmm. he's uh, partially uh, paralyzed. This is why I don't don't believe that the weight uh, of Muhammad Def on the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, life of the uh, military wing is that big Muhammad Def is more than uh, of a symbol than an effective uh, leader that leads the day-to-day -day mm -hmm. operation of uh, of Hamas. Nevertheless, uh, yeah, in the precedent uh, uh, part, Amir Oren raised something uh, important that there is uh, uh, when you target the the, um, the, the senior uh, militants, you don't know what would be uh, the consequences. Uh, so the uh, value for cost, you don't know uh, when to uh, when to uh, measure it and when to see the the real uh, results. But no doubt that if Muhammad Def was hurt, the, the the rockets would be continuing on Israel. But it would be a very important moral hit uh, uh, to uh, to Hamas. Right. I don't. I'm not sure that it could be a game changer, but something that Hamas will take into consideration in its uh, uh, calculations. And Boaz, this does bring up the philosophical question more. How effective is uh, our targeted? assassination. It's been something that uh, we've seen uh, throughout Israel's history and something that has also been condemned uh, time and again by the international community. Of course, I mean, and of course, uh, during what you've just now uh, shown, of course, for the international community, they don't see only the death of this for us, this huge uh, terrorist. They would see, of course, the civilians uh, dying with him, accompanying him mm -hmm. to another world. And this is unfortunately for Israel, because Israel is not targeting civilians, but uh, leaders of, 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 of Hamas or terrorist groups. Now, concerning what you said about game changer, uh, I do believe it is. Concerning Daf, I do believe, or Mohammed F, I do believe it is a game changer. And why? We said, I mean, during those 44 days from the beginning that every side, I mean, is seeking, is looking for this winning picture. We said that again and again and again. I do believe that for Israel, in order to make concessions afterwards around the table, if they do have this picture, it will be easier for Netanyahu, on the contrary, to maybe find a solution uh, around the table to this conflict. So I do hope for the ones who want, first of all, peace and tranquility in the Middle East, that Mohammed is, def, uh, will not be with us. I mean, I don't think that he uh, uh, contributes uh, to the peace in the Middle East or in the region or for his people by themselves. And also around the table to find a solution and maybe even for Gaza, maybe find an opening for the population. But now, can, it do, can it not do exactly the opposite, these targeted assassinations? Can it not, as Ali said, perhaps uh, uh, strengthen so support? So let's check. Let's but check, we've I checked mean, in the past, and we've seen that maybe... On uh, the contrary, uh, let's check, for mm -hmm. example. Okay, it is true that, I mean, it's like, a, let's imagine, God forbid, now, I mean, they found me something in my body which is like cancerous, so they're going to eliminate something. Uh, no, because they know that I'll have something else in next year or two years, they won't treat it anymore. So that's a philosophy. Mm -hmm. Some people say, I'll live with it because I know it, and I will just go to my with my pain and die. On the contrary, I'll check, I'll do something with it and a surgery and go and maybe hoping that it will be good afterwards. And second thing is that uh, Hamas leaders or terrorist group leaders must know that they will pay for what they do. I mean, it's like a criminal, what? Because he's a thief, so you won't put him in jail because when he leave jail, he will be a thief again or you'll have other thieves uh, around or murderers. No, this is not the case. Right, I mean, you're really punished. The so, this, so this is the answer I'll give you. 2004, you've just now seen mm -hmm. uh, uh, Rantisi, uh, uh, Sheikh Yassin, right. this uh, Algeria uh, 
honest uh, religious uh, guy. I mean, those uh, two people that were eliminated, what did we have just before? We had suicide attacks. You remember, did we have any suicide attack afterwards? There was totally a connection between their elimination. I don't call it assassination. I would call it more elimination. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, and the, the end of the... Uh, of the completing of the building of the fans, yeah, but the that's wall, fact. Uh, that everybody is, the unanimity is dead, the wall but that was... Contributed. That contributed. That's part of fighting terrorism. That's part of. I mean, someone has to pay the price. I mean, if you do what you do, you must know, you must understand that Israel, sooner or later, will find you. Otherwise, I mean, uh, what do you, I mean, what message do you send them? Uh, I mean, if the result, at the end of the day, I mean, you have an operation and you've got 1,800 yeah, or 1,000 uh, civilians. What we're saying that this image of victory uh, reduced to the elimination of, of Muhammad Def will what not solve the tomorrow conflict, uh, will not solve the next round, and will not will not bring any uh, strategic input to the conflict. It is maybe so a strong tactical uh, achievement for the uh, mm -hmm. Israeli uh, you, army, but it doesn't. No, 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 of course, no, no, it's no, a no, it's not. It's not I mean, look. First of all, I mean, you've got Hamas, you've got their philosophy, you've got their ideology, and of course, I mean, in order for me, if you ask me, how would you solve this problem? Is by eliminating Hamas. That's what I think. Now you know that right now. Now, as the war uh, took place and also the target of Israel and the, how would I say, the, the fact that the Israeli government has limited it to tunnels and to stop the rockets and tranquility for tranquility, that changed everything and that is why for 44 days we're still suffering from this uh, 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 firing. But, but, one thing. You, for the 44 days, I mean, you and I, we sp go between the English uh, channel mm -hmm. to the French channel, and we speak a lot, and I think that one, uh, and we know each other for uh, many, many years. So I know that you really believe, and that's a good thing, of course, to solve problems around the table. It's much more logical, less people die. That's a better thing, I think, for everybody. But in order to succeed in doing so, you must eliminate people who don't really believe, yes, in negotiations, who more believe in blood blood, death, and more blood. This is yeah, but, uh, the speech of Muhammad Dev, there was a, a famous sentence. He said, we are going to win this war because we succeeded to create a generation that believe in death, a, cre a, cre a generation that uh, 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 committed its life to death. We don't, the Israelis want to live. We want uh, mm -hmm. uh, to die. Modern, and and modern like, for example, if you take Fatah and Hamas, the uh, executions, the assassinations of Fatah leaders, I do uh, believe was the main reason for the uh, Al-Aqsa Mater Brigades, the military wing of Fatah, mm -hmm. to accept a, a truce with uh, with Israel. Of course, the fact that Hamas took over the Gaza Strip in the uh, the famous coup d'etat of uh, 2007 helped the uh, Fatah to reach, uh, sure. to decide definitively that we don't believe in the uh, violent uh, tracks. But Hamas is a Hamas an Islamic organization. And the militants of Hamas look to, towards the jihadist groups mm -hmm. and not towards the secular, liberal, and other uh, 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 groups, uh, but Hamas, Hamas leaders believe that they should be uh, they should be more radical in their terminology, in their mm -hmm. uh, uh, in their discourse, uh, because of the threat that present for them the jihadist group that uh, that now recruit more militants than Hamas do. Hamas in the period of calm, meaning, so Hamas, meaning conclusion, me as Israel, the conclusion should be so I should treat Hamas according to what you say as angels. No, so no, no, no. You should decide. You should decide mm -hmm. to go for. The raison d'etre of, uh, of Hamas is conflict and tension. Good. When there is uh, talks and, uh, and negotiations, Hamas, uh, Hamas like uh, is this, uh, there is uh, uh, Hamas is disabled, and the Israeli said, the yeah. Israeli are maneuvering between the need to reach calm and the need to keep Hamas somewhere alive, politically mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. alive, in order to prevent a pressure over Israel to talk with Abu Mazen about all the Palestinian uh, conflict and not about a small. Uh, okay, one thing, conflict one thing in Ramallah agree. or, uh, or right. a problem in the Gaza Strip. Uh, in the world standards, every time there is a targeted killing, you don't really see much condemnation from the world because maybe, as uh, Boaz says, they do understand that that's the way or they believe yeah, that that's the way to... Yeah, we're not peacemakers. Be. We do agree they are not. We're not talking about uh, uh, no, peacemakers. No, but it, would, you say, would you say that is uh, the same question I asked for Boaz, is it effective to any kind of extent? Because the world, of course, doesn't condemn Israel about targeted killing. For the does, future of the Palestinian people. As long as, long as the uh, military uh, discourse mm -hmm. is, the, is the ruling uh, discourse, you have enemies and you should get rid of your enemies. But the question is, are you ready to change the discourse? Mm -hmm. Are you ready to put something else on right. the table? And the discourse that, that should be uh, uh, ruling this uh, this uh, conflict is the uh, negotiations uh, uh, channels, is the uh, negotiation uh, hope. And not only uh, because uh, what what the Egyptians say yesterday, that Hamas and the Israeli delegation were at the same position uh, 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Egyptian proposal, while the Egyptian and the Americans and the PLO part of the Palestinian uh, delegation wanted to sign over the uh, Egyptian uh, mm -hmm. paper. Right. Which, the only thing I would say, I mean, with Hamas, concerning Hamas, and you know what I think about negotiations with them and what I think about this uh, terrorist group, something I wouldn't say, for example, about uh, other Arab countries or, or even uh, Abu Mazen, to whom I uh, have a lot of respect, as I can say that openly. But concerning Hamas, if with Hamas, between Hamas and Israel, the problem was a territorial problem, as they tried to present it, I would be much more optimistic. Unfortunately, this is not a territorial problem. With the Palestinian Authority, with PLO, people tell me, well, you had the same in, uh, with, the, with the PLO in 1993. I mean, but you can't compare. You mm -hmm. cannot compare. Hamas is Hamas and PLO is PLO. And by the way, if you come with me to Ramallah, this is why the PLO out, say that, speak. that the, some of the Israelis prefer having Hamas as enemy, as, yeah. as rival, in order but to that's turn too easy. That's a shortcut. religious that's a shortcut. one. That's a shortcut. Religious one. That's a shortcut because history has proven, and not a far away history, that when you do have, I mean, a chance to make peace, I mean, you know, Israel is a democracy and you've got governments and you've got every four years elections. I think that the government that will not seize the chance of peace will not uh, continue uh, for many, many years. So you've seen that in 1993, when, when they were serious on the other side, we were serious too. Right now with Hamas, I'm very sorry to say, you have no one, nothing, no, no one to negotiate with. And unfortunately, let's again remember I yeah, mean, the, 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 the public right now. No, another thing. Hamas is not only against Israel. I mean, you mm. forget, it's against Judaism. It's against what I represent. Me, a Jew, I am re I'm responsible for World War One. It's in the Charter. World War Two, the French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. I am the evil of, of all. I mean, let's not forget who, what we're talking if about. If you pay the tax to Hamas, Hamas, maybe they will accept you uh, uh, but as the you know what? You know what? In, in if, the if, if that would help, I would pay them. But only one thing. I mean, what a summer we had. What a summer what we a had. Summer we oh, had we're, still we're still having. We're still having. Uh, Bismut, uh, thank you for joining, thank joining you us. Foreign Affairs Editor for Israel Leom. Ali, thank you for joining us. We're going to go quickly to the i24 News Desk for more headlines. And we'll be back with more Morning Edition. Welcome back to I-24 News Morning Edition. It is day 44 of Operation Protective Edge. The four and a half hours of quiet that we uh, experienced here in Israel throughout the night ended uh, this uh, morning with the launch of rockets at Israel South throughout uh, this morning. Last night, Hamas breached the extended truce when it fired a salvo of rockets into Beersheba. The fire intensified later into the night. Up to 60 rockets were fired towards Jerusalem and Tel Aviv areas and Israel south. An Iron Dome intercepted at least five rockets. Meanwhile, Israeli Air Force have attacked targets throughout the night in the Gaza Strip. Hamas did claim earlier that Israel struck the home of Hamas military chief Mohammed Def, killing his wife and daughter. And we are receiving reports that Israel has confirmed it attempted to assassinate uh, Mohammed Def. We do not know uh, the condition of Def. We do know that uh, his um, uh, wife and daughter have been killed, and there is a third body which has yet to be identified. With me in studio is I-24 News Editor Charles Biebelser. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. And Anthony Grant, you will be here soon with some headlines. Charles, I want to show you first uh, the U.S. State Department's response to the breach of the truce yesterday. Let's take a look. It's our understanding that an extension was agreed to, but that since has been broken. Uh, we are very concerned about today's developments, condemn the renewed rocket fire, and as we have said, Israel has a right to defend itself against such attacks. We call for an immediate end to rocket fire and hostilities and a return to ceasefire talks. We hope that the parties can reach an agreement on a sustainable ceasefire or, if necessary, agree to yet another extension of their temporary ceasefire so they can continue in conversation. So, Charles, uh, obviously the U.S. is taking a, a pretty strong stance there, telling that Hamas is the one that has breached uh, the truce. What we spoke earlier with Ali Waqid, who said Hamas didn't take responsibility for the first salvo of rockets in uh, Beersheba, and only after the reports of Mohammed Def's targeted uh, attempt assassination did they start firing rockets. The situation is murkier and murkier, and it's quite clear now that the United States uh, also, its tool set is quite uh, ending, with Cairo talks uh, now uh, also at a stalemate. Indeed. I, I mean, first of all, this statement uh, coming out of the U.S. is obviously something that will be music to uh, Netanyahu's ears. It's a firm statement, and it really puts um, the onus on Hamas again for renewing the hostilities, which is very, very important for Israel at this stage, which obviously has been condemned widely in the international community. The question is, is where do things go from here? Um, it's almost as if people here are really saying that it's been like a return to year zero. 
um, it, we seem to be where we were at the beginning of Operation uh, Protective Edge, where the government is kind of saying that it will accept a quiet, will be met with quiet kind of approach. But then you have the targeting or alleged targeting of death uh, which seems to be uh, certainly an escalation of things if the Israeli military has renewed the targeted uh, killing of Hamas militants. Mm -hmm. Um, so at the same time, when you look at targeted killings in the past, uh, and, and we, there are quite a few, we spoke about it in the last segment, it's, it's still unclear how effective they are in terms of the operation for the short term, and definitely for the long term, it, it's clear Hamas is still standing. That's true, but it's certainly something that Netanyahu can present to his, um, mm -hmm. you know, to proponents of further military action in his security cabinet, and it's also demoralizing uh, as well to Hamas, and at the same time, it shows the Israeli public that Israel is serious about continuing the military operation and actually you know there's the the saying to cut the head off of the snake so to speak mm -hmm. obviously um, Def is a key figure in Hamas's military wing he's built Hamas's military wing it certainly would be a military success whether it's a game changer that remains to be seen it will really depend on whether Israel continues with its military activities but as things stand it really seems as though the ball is still in Hamas's court and Israel really will respond in kind to mm -hmm. Hamas's actions. And just uh, 24 hours ago, we were still talking about uh, you know, the UN uh, Human Rights Council uh, Commission and so forth, other international pressure that, is go that was uh, pointed towards Israel and still pointing towards Israel. The question is, though, now, it, now that the rockets have continued and may continue, no ceasefire is in sight for now, will the international community and, and bodies such as the UNHRC, which have been criticized for its... Uh, one-sidedness from the beginning now have to kind of step down. One would think that to be true, um, but the reality is probably going to be quite different. Um, as soon as the death toll in Gaza continues to pile up, which is un an unfortunate shame, uh, the images coming out of Gaza are, are nothing but shocking. Um, that being said, um, as you saw, Marie Harf said uh, that Israel retains its right to defend itself. Uh, unfortunately, the international community does view Israel as the aggressor, uh, even though this is really a war of self-defense. And we're just going uh, to update that there was uh, have, have been more uh, sirens in the Khof Ashkelon Regional Council. Obviously, our rockets have not stopped. Uh, Charles B. Blizzard, uh, thank you for joining us. We're going to just uh, go through uh, the, the, the sequence of today. Uh, we, of course, uh, did uh, have uh, reports early from last night uh, talking about Hamas, saying that Israel did try to attempt uh, to kill Mohammed Def. This was uh, given to us by uh, Musa Marzouk on his Facebook page. We have now uh, received confirmation from Israeli officials, according to reports, that Israel did indeed uh, try to target uh, uh, Mohammed Def. We do not know uh, the state of his... Uh, of death at the moment. We do know that his wife and child uh, have been killed in this targeted attempt. Now we're going to go to uh, Shachal Pellet, I-24 News correspondent in Ashkelon this morning. Shachal, what's the latest from there? Yes, uh, good morning. Once again here from the southern city of Ashkelon. It's been a very noisy uh, past uh, hour. Two rockets intercepted above the city in the greater area of Ashkelon. One more rocket over the southern city of Ashdod and several more rockets and mortars exploding in open areas uh, around the uh, uh, surrounding area of the Gaza Strip. The northern part is uh, definitely under fire and this uh, is uh, in continuing in continuous uh, fire to uh, Israel over the past uh, 24 hours uh, since uh, yesterday afternoon, over 70 rockets, a barrage, a big barrage of rockets fired uh, at uh, the entire country reaching Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, but especially the south and especially this morning is uh, under continuous fire. And we hear of uh, 2,000 soldiers uh, that have been called once again to reserve duty after they have uh, uh, they have been uh, supposed to be released uh, yesterday. Uh, and so uh, this is a, a probable uh, escalation uh, towards a uh, uh, possibility of a uh, uh, ground infiltration, uh, although we hear from the uh, military that most of the uh, strikes and attacks uh, will uh, be conducted by the Israeli Air Force, and indeed they have targeted uh, dozens of, uh, um, of uh, terror t targets inside the Gaza Strip throughout the night and this morning. Uh, we hear from medical uh, Palestinian sources that seven family members have been killed inside the Gaza Strip in the central part of the Strip and scores more uh, injured. Back to you.
Shachal, of course, uh, we're just a few days before the start of the school year. Uh, what's the day of li routine uh, life uh, in Ashkelon this morning? And the home front has also issued its new commands uh, after, of course, uh, saying that you can go back uh, to normal life. Yes, well, uh, so far the uh, um, the home front commander uh, instructions uh, remain very cautious. People need to stay uh, nearby shelters and uh, uh, secure structures. Uh, here in Ashkelon, we see that life uh, is attempting to uh, uh, continue as normal as possible, but uh, people have expressed uh, great fear in the, even in the past couple of days when it was uh, relatively quiet. Uh, today, of course, uh, uh, people are very much afraid to leave their homes and uh, um, prepare towards uh, the uh, upcoming uh, school year. Uh, only a two, two days ago when we were here, we saw that the shopping walls were packed with people uh, buying uh, um, equipment for school. Uh, today will probably be a, a quieter day with uh, people uh, um, not willing to uh, leave their homes as uh, the uh, fire continues over the city. Shahal Pered there in Ashkelon. Thank you for that update. You, of course, will be updating us throughout the day here at I-24 News. Uh, thank you once more. Anthony, you're here with some headlines from the web, uh, assuming that it's not all Operation Protective Edge. It isn't. Um, there is a lot of news going on around the world, obviously, as always. But, of course, things that are happening in Israel um, do make a splash on the Internet. And actually, mm -hmm. um, we're seeing so many uh, opinion pieces going back and forth. Um, in, we talked about the British press earlier. The Washington Post, um, I liked this um, op-ed piece from yesterday, um, which says Israel is held to an impossible standard. Mm. You don't see that kind of thing too often in the UK press these days, but without getting too into this writer's argument, you know, um, basically saying that uh, Israel is not as bad as its critics insist. Mm -hmm. um, again, a very moderate kind of uh, voice there from the Washington Post, which is not everyone thinks it is the most moderate kind of paper, but, you know, again, these things are, people are emailing each other things. Uh, did you right. see this opinion piece about Israel, this one about Gaza? It's like yeah. uh, the, the information has become, wars. Has become a... Facebook trade tweets, yeah. you name it. A library of op-eds. Op exactly. <laughs> What else do you have? Um, actually, uh, shifting back into um, a very important political arena, I want to just mention from the Times of India, okay. um, headline here saying, um, we are not subservient to India. Uh, Jammu and Kashmir are disputed territory, Pakistan says. Yeah. This so comes if anyone thought that there were in, uh, any other conflicts in the world, then uh, remember that there's also India and Pakistan. And this is a huge one, because yeah. of course, Kashmir uh, is, a, is a very disputed territory. And this was a day after India um, canceled uh, high-level talks because the Pakistan Pakistani envoy met with Kashmiri separatists. That's a big no-no in mm -hmm. India. So again, um, that uh, dispute uh, is a uh, very far from resolution and making headlines in that part of the world. Um, South China Morning Post, okay. also this is being talked about in Australia a lot. Um, we have a Clive Palmer, who was a mining baron, who's also a member of Australia's parliament, getting into a lot of hot water for something he said. He basically publicly called, described the government of China as bastards who shoot their own people and want to take over Australia's resources. Oh. Now that caused the class in diplomacy. A bit of a, a diplomatic little, yeah. flap has ensued. Sued, <clears throat> as one yeah. might imagine, um, the government of Australia <clears throat> is saying you've basically embarrassed us and you've even benefited from financial gain from China. Again, this guy's very outspoken and so down under that is causing a bit of a stir online and off. Um, right, what else? Up in uh, the UK, while well, the Wall Street Journal reports about Russia, Russians snapping up hot properties in London. And very interesting because you would think with all the sanctions going on and the talk of them that it would, it would put a damper on purchases, but actually no. The headline says that the rich Russians in the UK think about sanctions but keep buying swanky <laughs> mansions. Nothing's really stopping yeah. them. Yeah. I mean, you can let a person <laughs> dream. Exactly. <laughs> they're they're dreaming about sanctions but actually they, it's, buying it's, mansions. It's, it's like cocktail party fodder, you know, over Makes vodka sense. or whatever. You know, and a lot of these uh, Russian rich Russians, I'm just taking it from the headline, the headline there. Yeah. I, I would not uh, I refer to them that way. Uh, uh, are also, uh, you know, they also have Israeli citizenship. A lot of them, ah. uh, yeah, like Robin, Roman Abramovich, the, yes. the the owner of Chelsea and so forth. I think he does have one of the biggest houses in the UK. I'm not quite sure. In London, actually. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Apparently, you know, they're actually, I guess, in a way, helping the British economy. You could make the argument. So, I uh, mean, you know, they're keeping the it. real estate agents happy. Well, if they happy. ever want to Airbnb their mansion when they're away yeah. somewhere, I'm, I'm uh, willing and able to, you know, hop over to London whenever. Yeah. Hang uh, out in 
there mentioned. Let's let's check out those Airbnb <laughs> listings. I think it's a good idea. Looks tempting there. It does. Um, in Iceland, things are brewing. Are we're talking they? <laughs> yes. There's brewing. a grow literally speaking, That's mother nature. That's a horrible pun. Well, brewing mother nature. Ice, yes. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the picture there of a volcano about mm -hmm. to erupt. Apparently, uh, there's been uh, earthquakes around the Bardar Bunga volcano. And this is causing some concern because it was just uh, 2010 that another Icelandic volcano, of course, erupted and it basically um, affected 10 million uh, people by uh, putting uh, all that ash into the air. So it affected the air travel. So that could happen again. Of course, I Iceland is a very seismically um, active um, island. Right. Uh, with or without Bjork singing. So um, <laughs> we're watching that closely in the uh, the European press to see what happens with the, um, the volcano there. Right. Um, I mean, I, I, I was one of those stranded travelers. Not way fun. Back when. No, not fun. Not fun. Unless you really like duty free shopping. No, I wasn't stranded in an airport, but I was stranded. Oh, okay. Yeah, but anyway. Nonetheless. Nonetheless, okay. um, if you were uh, stranded uh, for duty-free shopping, you could buy a celebrity fragrance okay. uh, from Justin Bieber, perhaps, oh, or no. uh, Taylor Swift. This guy doesn't stop. No, you know that he has a, a, a fragrance uh, named Girlfriend, but apparently, <laughs> actually, the sales aren't doing very well. And the parent company, which is actually um, Elizabeth Arden, has blamed pop singers Justin Bieber and Taylor Swift for contributing to um, their very lackluster sales this year because their yeah. perfume, even though they have these celebrity names attached to them, apparently people aren't, aren't snapping them up. I'm, I'm trying to imagine what Justin Bieber's fragrance would smell like. Yeah, he's got three. Girlfriend, oh, there you go. <laughs> Someday, and The Key. And The Key? Yes. Uh, they're not the most, um, oh. how shall I put it, uh, appetizing names. No. I mean, it's a little bit strange. Put some girlfriend on you. It was some girlfriend. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Taylor Swift's fragrance yeah. is simply called Taylor. And That's she better. also has one called Wonderstruck. But classy, 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 a little classier. Well, it's not yeah. hard to be classier than Justin Bieber. Yeah, and I wonder what Justin Bieber, who's his audience? I mean, he's selling to these like 15 year old boys? Girls. Girls. Or, or both. Right. Girlfriend. Who Got knows? It. You know, I think you should focus on the music. But anyway, um, The Independent has Pope, Pope Francis's latest words, which are causing a stir. Pope Francis has said, kind of unofficially, that he could retire basically uh, following in the footsteps of uh, Pope Benedict. Not right now, but in the future. It's something that he could think about envisaging because uh, Pope Benedict broke the ground in that department. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, he's maybe that's why he only uh, he had to pack in those three days in the Holy Land so so quickly because yeah. he was afraid he was going to retire oh, yeah. next year. I hope gonna, not. But. Well, hope, hopefully not and wishing him uh, just uh, good, uh, good health. Anthony Grant, yeah. uh, thank you for joining us. A quick update here from the I-24 news desk. Uh, there was a rocket that uh, landed in uh, the Chofash Galon area. Uh, no injuries uh, or damage reported as of now. And Hamas is calling on all Gaza residents come uh, participate in the funeral of Mohammed Def's daughter and wife. Obviously trying uh, to make it a game changer as we've been speaking about throughout uh, today's show. We're going to be back uh, with more I-24 News Morning Edition tomorrow. Next up are the headlines. I'm Yael Wisner-Levy. We'll see you tomorrow.